Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I am Ana Nieto, Head of Species Conservation Action at IUCN, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar. Before we start, just a few important announcements. The webinar will be in English, but simultaneous interpretation is available in French and Russian. For those of you who wish to listen to the interpretation, you just need to click on the planet icon at the bottom center of your Zoom window and then make your language selection. Also, you may use the chat to ask questions to our panelists or make any comments. Our facilitator will select as many questions as time allows and the speakers will have some time to answer them at the end of each panel session. For those of you who cannot stay with us until the end or would like to recap or share the proceedings of the event, a recording will be available on the event webpage as of Friday. The link is now in the chat. Good day, everyone. This is the first of a series of IUCN webinars that share lessons learned, best practices, and experiences from the projects on the ground that we are funding through the Save Our Species program and the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation program. The IUCN Save Our Species and Tiger programs are grant-making facilities that focus on improving the conservation status of threatened species, their habitats, as well as improving the livelihoods of local communities who depend on the natural resources for their societal, cultural, and economic well-being. In the management of these facilities, we coordinate, strive for complementarity, and bring together lessons learned to achieve long-lasting positive conservation outcomes. The topic of today's webinar is livelihoods, and specifically the important question, what makes livelihoods work? Communities across the world depend on natural resources for their basic needs. These include medicinal plants, herbs and fruits, firewood, honey, wild game, water, natural pollination of crops, cultural and spiritual values. To ensure the survival of both people and nature, more sustainable livelihood options may be considered and may include provision of energy efficient stoves to reduce reliance on firewood, sustainable utilization of natural forest products to generate community income, community-based tourism enterprises among others, efforts towards the sustainable coexistence of people and nature should consider communities' motivations to implement conservation actions. This may include the economic benefit derived from their direct employment or the exploitation of natural resources, the social development enabled through maintaining these resources and the safeguarding of cultural practices. This session will focus on what can be achieved, both in terms of biodiversity and livelihoods. We will aim to demonstrate how our projects around the world not only implement effective short and long-term conservation strategies, but also build capacity among the conservation community. I look forward to hearing the lessons learned by our experienced speakers and after to a lively discussion. Together, let's help answer the question, what makes livelihoods work? Now, I would like to introduce you to our facilitator, Gretchen Walters. Gretchen is assistant professor at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Over to you, Gretchen. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I also wanted to add that I'm a social scientist and biologist and on the advisory committee of the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program. So um, about the, the, the agenda today, um, first we will hear from, uh, from four speakers um, and then we will have time for question and answers. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. We will also be fielding questions in French and Russian. Um, and so, and after that, we will have a second panel of four speakers, all, all grantees. Um, and then at the end of that, we will also have a second period of questions and answers. Um, and so please don't hesitate to, to put your questions in the chat. At the end, we'll have um, some highlights that, that we've, uh, we've pulled from these eight presentations and, and then a closing. Um, I wanted to remind you briefly of the goal today. Uh, today is about learning. 
and learning what we can from the from these eight projects that will be presented um, and to present not only the successes but also the challenges that we have and how they've been over and how they've been overcome so don't hesitate to ask questions uh, uh, of this of this nature um, so now i'd like to move on to the introduction of the first speakers of the first part of the uh, the panel panel one uh, the mm. first qui est le docteur Sanjay Goubi, euh, scientifique senior à la Fondation Conservation de la Nature, responsable du programme Fondation Olimati de la Nature. Il va nous faire Then we'll be followed by uh, Manoli Sizavan, uh, who's the deputy country director of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Lao um, PDR. And uh, she will be talking to us about corridors and conservation of the white cheek gibbon. Then that will be followed by uh, Professor Inza Kone, who will be speaking to us about the Ivory Coast and, uh, um, and, river, and how COVID has impacted the community conservation efforts there. Professor Kone is the Director General of the Swiss, uh, of the Swiss, conservation, um, of the Swiss conservation Center in Ivory Coast. And finally, we will be uh, at the first panel, we will be hearing from Madagascar, where we will hear from Mahafatiana Arevata. Um, um истории из Мадагаскара, где I hope uh, the video is very visible because I'm in the field. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, interjunction of Eastern and Western Guards in Southern India. Next slide, please. I'm talking to you about a place where the forest habitat or the, the habitat where we work called the Kaveri MM Hills landscape is normally dominated by the woodland savanna like this. Next slide. And uh, we have beautiful riverine habitat and the summer's temperatures can go up to 40, 40, 42 degrees centigrades. And this is how the landscape will look like. And a lot of people may not believe that this kinds of landscape hosts tigers and elephants, doles, leopards, and several other wildlife species. Next slide, please. And it also has critically endangered species as listed by the IUC and the uh, Indian pangolin. Next one. The, there's a, a bit of prey for uh, large carnivores, including the red, uh, northern red muntjac. Next slide. And it also has variety of species, right from this uh, small uh, uh, species called as a madras tree shoe. Next slide. To the massive uh, 4,000, 5,000 kg weighing elephants, the Asiatic elephants, which you see it inside the river Kaveri, which flows through the landscape in this area. Next slide. And then we also have other species which you generally um, uh, recognize with African species, the honey badger, next one. Uh, we also have the rusty spotted cat, which is the smallest wild cat in the world. Uh, the dole, which is again an endangered species as per the IUCN red list, next slide. And of course, the topping for the ice cream is the tiger, the Panthera tigris, uh, which is found in this landscape. Uh, it's an area where we work, uh, which is uh, which includes three protected areas, the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary on the northernmost uh, uh, brown polygon, then the MM Hills Wildlife Sanctuary, and to the uh, westernmost part uh, of the polygon is called the BRT Tiger Reserve. The entire landscape is about two and a half thousand square kilometers, just the protected areas, but the whole landscape is nearly 10,000 square kilometers with varying uh, densities and abundances of um, uh, tigers and elephants and other prey species. Next slide, please. And when I first started working in this uh, area as a wildlife biologist, one of the things I strongly saw the degradation of habitat, which started to become a key problem, which is a key problem in this landscape. And one of the issues was actually collection of firewood for by local communities. Next slide, please. And as a wildlife biologist, you also had to look at the wildlife angle. You know, many of the species, we, we carried out a huge socioeconomic survey and we found out about 23 species of 
trees were harvested by people uh, and uh, out of which 19 species were important fodder species, including species for uh, fodder species for uh, uh, species like elephants. Next slide. So we came out with a very simple idea of providing them alternative benefits. Uh, and one of the most logistically uh, uh, preferred, economically preferred uh, alternative by the communities was, about, uh, was to provide uh, uh, LPG cook stoves and the connection required for that. And till date, we have provided it to about 2,000 families, which has benefited over 10,000 uh, individuals. Next slide, please. But what is important was that to, when you provide an alternative to the live communities, you also need to measure your impact on ground. So when we started off, uh, we started off measuring how much per capita firewood was used by these communities, by individual families. And we saw there was a reduction of about 65% uh, after they were provided with alternatives. For example, in this uh, bar graph, you'll see they were collecting over 2,000, uh, 2, uh, 20,000 kilograms, over 20,000 kilograms of firewood uh, annually. And post that, it, uh, it reduced by about 65%. Next slide, please. And if I want to talk to, uh, in a common man's perspective, uh, uh, before we provided an alternative, the communities or the communities beneficiaries who, with whom we provided the alternatives were collecting firewood, which was worth or weighing about 450, 450 truckloads of firewood, which has now reduced to about 100 truckload of firewood. This is just to give you a larger perspective of how much firewood was going out of these communities. Next slide, please. So this was one measurement where I could show ecological recovery, but for communities, it's also important to demonstrate how it is benefiting, how wildlife conservation, how providing alternatives is also benefiting them. So we came up this idea of- Anjay, uh, you one have of one minute left, please. Okay. So we were measuring their lung functions uh, so to demonstrate how much benefits they have. Next slide, please. So we found out that actually uh, the usage of uh, firewood cook stove was impacting females a lot. About 60, uh, about uh, people with uh, firewood usage about 10 years, but over 25% of them already had chronic lung functions problems. Next slide, please. So there were several other social impacts. For the example, this lady, go to the next slide. After we provided her a LPG cook stove, she found more time. And she now, you can see a recovery, economic recovery in her family itself. She was able to buy a cow and she was able to sell milk and her entire economics changed completely. So it's not just the economic uh, changes. It's not just the social changes. It's also the ecological changes which we need to measure. And this has to come out through a community perspective. And also we need to demonstrate them social benefits for these communities. Thank you very much. And I'll be available for uh, questions later. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Right, right on time. Um, so uh, please put your questions in the chat if you have any at this moment. Uh, and we'll move on to the next presenter, um, which will be Manoli Sisavana. It's over to you, please. Thank you, Christian, and good afternoon from Laos. Um, I think my PowerPoint is not on yet, but um, okay, here it is. Uh, in Lao PDR, WCS is working with a national protected area called Nam At Pului Management Unit uh, to co-implement the IUCN SOS funded project titled Securing Corridor to Connect Populations of Northern Maishi Gibbon across the landscape of Nam At Pului National Park. The park is one of the largest protected areas in Laos. It's covered the areas of over 400,000 hectares of dry evergreen and mixed deciduous forest, encompassing three provinces, 10 districts, and home to 40,000 people. It is the most biodiverse and socially, um, socially and ecologically important conservation area in the country and also home to important wildlife species, including cat species, big cats, um, mammal species, and also bird species. And at least 33 of them are of conservation concern, including the critically endangered Northern Waishi Gibbon. And um, recent, the recent survey of the populations of Waishi Gibbon have detected at least uh, 65 different groups of gibbons in the park. So that confirms that Nam Ed is an important habitat to save this uh, 
globally important species. Next slide, please. For this particular project that is funded by the IUCN SOS, um, we have been protecting the species and their habitat to, through implementing of an integrated landscape management approach. Uh, the program includes uh, natural resources protection through smart patrol and also biodiversity monitoring, outreach and awareness raising program, as well as uh, communities, livelihoods and employment opportunities because uh, in the context of Laos, people and forests are inseparable. People live inside and around the forest and depend on natural resources for livelihoods. And uh, key activities under this project include habitats and species protection through supporting forest patrol uh, activities by ensuring that um, FBIC and safeguards are strictly followed in order to reduce illegal activities uh, of two narrow corridor, which you see in the PowerPoint in the eastern part and uh, the western part of the corridor, which are connectivity of the Gibbon habitat across the landscapes. Next slide, please. Uh, with the integrated management uh, approach that adopted by the government of Laos, particularly Department of Forestry, whom uh, provide supervision or leadership uh, of uh, protected area management in the country. Uh, I'm at Pulu Management Unit and WCS are working with guardian communities of Nam at Pulu in both sides of the eastern and western corridors to balance economic and uh, livelihoods activities, development needs of the communities with uh, conservation of biodiversity. And we are using the guardian village approach, which includes several participatory steps as listed there, including the FBIC participatory rule of appraisal, participatory land use planning, community action plan, and guardian village conservation communities to ensure that human rights are respected and that local communities have a say in interventions that will affect their lives. And all this process eventually results in collaborative management of the park and also livelihoods improvement and benefits to the people. Next, I know that please. you have one minute left, please. Okay, um, the, there are two uh, products that I want to introduce today. On the Eastern Corridor, we are working with five villages in developing local capacity for the production of uh, undershade grown uh, wildlife coffee, which benefits 80 households through uh, the contracts that it's um, making with the Saffron Coffee Enterprise, and then the returns would be the, the premium rate. Next, last slide, please. And in the Western Corridor, we employ members of communities, over 160 community households, uh, community members from three villages as a tour guide and porters and cooks and service provider for ecotourism uh, eco program. And then the benefits that come out of this, it's, it creates direct link between results of community conservation efforts and increased economic benefits. It's also provide alternative income source for communities. And it demonstrates the value uh, of the healthy wildlife population in providing sustainable income opportunities for the communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also right on time, Manoli. Um, so we'll, we'll continue on. We'll move on from, from Laos and now we'll move down, uh, to West Africa and hear from Professor Inze Kone. Over to you. Thank you, Gretchen. So my project is about the conservation of the Tanwe A forest uh, and this uh, exceptional primate fauna. The Tanwe forest is a swampy, non-protected forest covering 12,000 hectares in the southeastern corner of Côte d'Ivoire. Next slide. So 11 villages are involved in the project. And uh, the main target species are four of the most endangered primates of West Africa, uh, the white nap uh, Magabe, uh, the Rollaway Guinon, the white type Colobus, and Miss Wadron's Red Colobus. These monkeys and their historical distribution range 
had not been the focus of any conservation project before us. This project is an example of how communities can play major roles in conservation activities combined with local development. Next slide. The Tanui A conservation project has uh, six different components uh, uh, research, so biological and socioeconomic research, awareness raising and education, community organization and capacity building, surveillance, support to the forest designation process. So, because it will soon be being, uh, it will soon be designated as a non as a protected areas managed by communities. And the final component is support to local development, uh, including support to alternative livelihoods. This component is especially important in the context of COVID-19 because the closure of the border with neighboring Ghana uh, has impacted negatively the, the local economy. Next slide. So, we supported the different uh, alternative livelihood activities. I mentioned just three here. Uh, the first one is agroforestry that we supported to increase the resilience of the agricultural systems and provide non-timber forest products in the future, as well as to increase carbon stock in the area. So we enabled to plant more than 20,000 seedlings. Come back, please. Previous slide. So we planted uh, more than 20,000 uh, seedlings in farmlands over more than 150 hectares. The second uh, alternative livelihood that we supported is cassava farming and processes, processing, sorry. Because cassava farming is a key economic activity in the area. This is the main food crop that is cultivated in this region. And finally, we also uh, developed value chain in cassava. So it was really important that uh, the incomes generated by these activities are increased. We focus on finding local markets because of the main market used to be the Ghanaian market, but as the, uh, the border is closed until today, yeah, it was really important to develop a local market for cassava, uh, I would say products. Next slide. So this support to alternative livelihoods as enabled to revitalize our community-based conservation system. Uh, people used to be discouraged, they used to be faced with new realities, but now they found new incentives that reboosted their engagement towards, uh, I would say, conservation. They, they, they resumed surveillance, for instance, and most of people changed attitudes towards the forest. They used to say, we don't have any tools, but explore forest resources. But now they see that conservationists are on their side and they feel motivated to, I would say, be engaged for conservation. And they organize awareness raising by peers. So they, they do their own uh, awareness raising campaigns and we just support them. We also Inza, believe that- Inza, you have one minute yeah. left, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we also believe that in the long term, uh, this support will increase the resilience of farming systems and will bring additional sources of income for communities through non-timber forest products and carbon credits. Thank you very much. Next slide to say thank you to our main donor and thank you to everybody for your attention. Next slide. Thank, thank you, Inza. Thank you very much. Um, please don't forget you can ask questions by putting them in the chat. We're already starting to field a few. Um, but before we answer questions, we're going to go on to the to the final speaker of this first panel. And so we'll move on to Madagascar, where we'll hear from Maifatiana Aralizata. Uh, over to you, Maifatiana. Hi. Uh, the slide is not there, <laughs> but uh, I can begin. Uh, hi, my name is Mahefa, and I have a PhD in life and environmental science, and uh, have 16 years uh, of experience in community-based conservation and protected area management also. 
Uh, I have been working with Malagast NGO Nitantika uh, since uh, 2019 as a conservation project officer responsible for the IUCN funded project to conserve lemurs and their habitat in one part of the COFA protected area of Madagascar. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my fa my uh, Fatiana, can you speak? Here? My Fatiana, yes? can you please speak a bit yes. more loudly? We have some trouble hearing you. Okay. Uh, so uh, over the past three years, our project has focused on conserving two critically endangered species, uh, the golden bamboo lemur and the southern raft lemur, and two endangered species too, the milne ever and the Gilbert lizard bamboo lemur. Although we have identified at least 11 species of lemur in the area, uh, this food tackling poaching of lemurs and destruction mitigation found lemur meat consumption prevalent along the three footpaths that cross the forest corridor east to west, responsible for the death of les muriens le long des trois sentiers qui traversent la forêt d'est en ouest, responsable de la mort d'environ 25 les muriens en l'espace. Les murs, 32 000 hectares, pourvoient cette cette sphère. Communication. In particular, when we have been working closely with the forest inhabitants and young people of the area who have become lemur monitors, and well as strengthening community forest management association, Lemurish community based information gathering and awareness raising initiatives have been combined with promotion of alternative source of income and protein that have successfully put an end to sale of mermaid snacks along the footpaths. Next slide. Sorry, Gretchen, can you hear me in the English channel? And full tree farming together with promoting uh, uh, of agroforestry techniques. The choice came out of many years of experience working with uh, local communities in the area and listening to their needs and desires. These activities that are concerned have been targeting specifically those people actually living within the protected area and they provide an alternative protein source to lemur meat. Promoting agroforestry techniques also aim to boost production on existing land without the need for farmer. Comme vous le voyez à l'écran, les silver bullets. Alors, il y a les agents. Les vivent avec les gens, so as to gain their trust and fully understand the local context. Through practical trainings and follow-up support, beneficiaries can really see the difference for themselves. We work closely with local leaders and are committed to this area long term. The pitfalls are what we are careful to avoid include capture of project benefits by the local elite. So we have careful directed action at the conservation target group and also avoiding handout and dependence on financial motivation for action. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Fatiana. Perfect. Now we're going to move on to the uh, to the questions and answers. Um, and so you've been putting some questions into the chat. We thank you for that. Please continue to do so. Um, but we're going to start already. We have about uh, 20 minutes for this uh, part. Um, 
And so the first question goes to Sanjay. A lot of people are very interested. Uh, we've had several questions about how the new gas bottles, the LPG gas bottles are funded. Um, so so um, first, can you talk about uh, um, if the government contributes to, to uh, helping the communities convert to gas, for example, um, and, uh, and, and where do they buy these bottles if they're in a remote place? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there were two questions which were very important asked by somebody called Peter Blakes. One is, can they afford to buy the LPG refill bottles? I think that's a very important question. What we saw from our surveys pre and post uh, uh, intervention is that the communities or the beneficiaries were spending about 102 days uh, uh, in for collection of fire road in a year, 102 days of uh, uh, labor. And most of them, most of it was collected by women. So uh, they were spared with 102 days of effort, which they have now started to use for other productive uh, activities, including economic activities, which could be agriculture or agricultural laborer, labor or like livestock rearing, like I told you. So that has actually, uh, that helps them to buy refill bottles, but in addition has given a lot of economic benefits to these uh, uh, beneficiaries. So uh, I hope that answers the first question by Peter Blakes. But the second one, which was also very important is about access to refill bottles. Yes, you're right. Uh, if the refill bottles are not brought to the doorsteps, this kind of activity will fail. So what we did was to ensure that we worked with the gas distribution company uh, and had a commitment from that side, from their side, that they would uh, provide the refill bottles to the doorsteps of each individual communities, wherever it was feasible logistically. For areas where it was not completely feasible logistically, we had to provide them other alternatives rather than LPG cook stoves, like uh, uh, firewood stoves, which were low in consumption of firewood. So actually one solution does not fit all aspects or all areas. So we have to take into consideration logistics and economics, but economics was clearly addressed because they were uh, saving about 102 uh, days of uh, uh, labor from firewood collection. Thank you. I um, wanted to, can I, can you also, also address, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but they, um, does the government contribute to helping communities convert to, to gas? Yes, uh, the government has a scheme, both the federal government and the state governments have their own schemes. But uh, one of the uh, riders that comes with the state government funded project is this that could be provided only to certain social classes, you know, what we call as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes uh, in India. Uh, who are supposed to be socially and uh, economically downtrodden. But there were a lot of other communities apart from them who were also economically downtrodden and who needed this kind of support and were uh, dependent on forests for firewood. So we had to cater and the government's uh, schemes mostly stopped at this particular uh, social classes. So we had to go beyond that uh, government schemes as well. So we act as a complementary agency to the government efforts. Uh, but what is uh, important is we measure both post and pre, pre and post intervention. We also measure ecological impacts, uh, not just firewood collection, but also recovery of wildlife populations and economics of people. Okay, thank you very much Sanjay for those great answers. We're going to move on to another question. This one is for Manoli. Um, the question uh, regards the, the fact that it's a new protected area in which you're working. Um, does, the, does the protected area law include provisions to govern the harvesting of wild living resources by local communities? And what about harvesting by communities from further away? Um, thank you. So in terms of use of protected area and also protected area resources, uh, including wildlife resources, and it's um, it's clearly recognized in the Lao policy and legislation framework, and it depends on let's say the the four questions: where, when, what, and how. In terms of where protected area in Laos are uh, half tree zone, totally protected zone, also known as core zones. Is a no-go zone, so people cannot go inside to collect uh, NTFP or resources in there. It's only reserved for conservation purposes. And then there's control use zone and buffer zone. These two zones are allowed for uh, conservation compatible use by local community, especially those who are living inside and adjacent 
to the protected areas. And then um, in terms of uh, what species or categories they can use, it's in terms of species, um, the wildlife law have uh, classified the wildlife species into three lists. The first one is prohibited, basically it's critically endangered and endangered species that um, uh, are not um, allowed for commercial use or also um, general use. But then there's uh, list two and list three. List two is managed, so uh, it's allowed to be used for um, traditional use and also uh, sub subsistence consumption. And the last one is list number three is general species which are under protection, but then it's because of the populations are still uh, widely available in Laos. So the, the use is less restricted. And in terms of wind, uh, Lao forest normally um, by the forestry law is that all the Laos forest categories are closed in May 31st of each year. That means the beginning of rainy season where the native species reproduce. Um, so um, starting from 1st of June, the forests are closed and a lot of species are not allowed to be harvested until it reopens again in September. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, how it's uh, in terms of how it's uh, re uh, related to the questions of, uh, of the tools and equipment that the community used to collect NTFP and also wildlife, um, it is uh, promoted to, to use only sustainable tools, especially traditional tools, and also the collections of those resources are uh, promoted for um, subsistence and also uh, traditionally consumption uh, only. And, and the last questions that um, she asked is with, what about the village from further, I guess the village that is not classified as guardian village. Uh, for those uh, in the new protected area decree that WCS and other stakeholders are helping the government to develop right now, will um, provide a permit system that the user uh, outside of the guardian village um, will have to apply for and uh, to attach with the use plan so that uh, guardian villagers together with park management authority can uh, vet and also approve the, the use according to plan and also monitor uh, the use as well. And, and uh, the fees and the fees that uh, have to pay for each use will go back to refinancing the park management and, and as well as community development scheme. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Manoli. We might come back to you with some other questions, but I also want to move on to some of the other panelists because we've had some questions there. So now I'll move on to, to Inza. Um, so when, a question uh, that we have is how do you prevent cassava plantations from encroaching into wildlife habitats, such as the protected area? Yeah, what we try to support is, I would say, environmentally friendly activities. And uh, the principle is to establish, I would say, farming systems, uh, I would say, uh, separated from the conservation system. So it means that, uh, uh, we have to practice agriculture uh, differently, agriculture, sorry, differently. And people can do that. They are used to doing that. We just try to promote uh, these uh, uh, good agricultural practices, uh, including agroforestry. So they try to reintroduce trees or to keep trees in their plantations so as to increase the resilience of their plantations. So this is what we've been promoting. And it should be clear that we will support only those who do not encroach over the protected area. Okay, thank you for that explanation. There, there's, um, there's another question related to that. The, um, the area of the forest where you work, you said it was not yet protected. Um, so how, does you, how, how are you involved in, uh, in, the, in, in helping protect this area and particularly with I issues of illegal hunting? Yeah, I mean, we have different uh, systems in Cote d'Ivoire 
uh, in most countries in West Africa. So we have the protected areas and non-protected area. Uh, this forest is classified uh, in the non-protected areas, but we are working to, 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 have, is to have this forest designated as a community managed forest. It will be a protection status. But we've been working with these communities for more than 10 years now to answer one question that I saw. And uh, in the process, governmental authorities as well as communities are strongly involved. And uh, the Minister of, uh, of the Ministry of Environment has taken a decree to establish the designation, the National Designation Committee for this forest, which means that from this decree, it is not possible for anyone to get a permit for whatever activities like logging or mining in this forest until the decision, the final decision is made. We've done everything needed for this decision to be made in the next uh, few months. That's really exciting to hear. So I look forward to hearing more about that uh, in, the coming, in the coming months. Uh, we may come back to you as well, but I want to move on to uh, some other questions for other panelists. So for my Fatiana, um, how do you face the big challenge of deforestation in Madagascar? Okay, uh, 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 deforestation in Madagascar is a, a, a very uh, big challenge, but uh, in our part, uh, we, we work closely with a uh, local community to, to do patrols uh, and uh, sensitize local people about uh, the forest, the benefits uh, to have a, a forest. Uh, and uh, uh, on these two, we, we, we work with them to plant uh, during the three years. So we plant uh, about uh, 60,000 60, uh, native trees uh, on the on this uh, forest too, and uh, we work closely with a uh, forestry administration uh, to sensitize people about the forestry legislation and uh, uh, to work with them to punish the people doing the deforestation. Okay. Thank you very much. There's a follow-up question there. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that you, you had to deal with elite capture. Um, yes. And so yes. how do you make sure the benefits как вы, go back to local communities? Как вы обеспечиваете, чтобы бенефиты от программы возвращались к местному сообществу? You can see this working on this area during uh, many years. So, uh, uh, before, uh, the creation of the protected area. Avant la création de l'air protégé, a fait un inventaire des gens qui vivaient dans la forêt. In addition, uh, our agent is uh, from the local community too, so they know who is uh, people from this community really living inside this forest before the creation of the protected area and who is uh, uh, who immigrate legally after so uh, it's why we 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 we, we know that uh, the beneficiaries are really people living in the forest okay thank you thank you very much um, we have about five minutes left in this segment, and we have um, some questions that could go to all the panelists. Um, and so uh, one question I think is quite important is, how long did it take for communities to start cooperating uh, and for the reported impact that your, your projects measure? How long did it take for that to be seen? Uh, is there somebody from the panel that wants to talk about the length that, that that question, if you could raise your hand. I can start if you want. Yes, please, Inza. Yeah, for me, for us, it's been quite immediate uh, because we use an approach uh, that consisted in understanding uh, right in the beginning the relationships of communities with the forest, 
or with nature in general. We try to understand, I would say, uh, their feelings, their skills, and what they wanted to do. Uh, once they understood that this forest was their natural heritage and only them could protect it, they, they, they felt already, I would say, enthusiastic about this, especially when you tell them that this forest is the only one that house the more endangered primates of West Africa, the only forest where you have uh, a chance to rediscover Miss Wadron's record of this, one of the very rare forests where you have an abundant population of runaway green on. So things like this, I would say, stimulate the feeling of pride. And uh, from this feeling of pride, when you value their local knowledges and local traditions, uh, you already have very strong engagement. And we got this engagement from the beginning until today. It's taken more than 10 years and communities are still mobilized. And thanks to new partners, we try to stimulate this engagement. That's a really interesting and positive response. I thank you very much. Um, are there other panelists who wanted to answer that, that question? I, I think it's quite key. Yes, Sanjay. Yeah, uh, what's very important is that uh, one of the key things that uh, helped us is that all of us come from local areas, you know, where we implement our project, including speaking the language, you know, people don't differentiate us, and all of our staff were 100% local staff. Uh, that was one important aspect. The second important aspect I had is that I personally grew up in a very rural area. Uh, within my in my country, so it built in a brought in a very good understanding of socio political aspects of conservation. So if you went into a community, you would understand the uh, India. You know, perhaps a lot of you know about the caste system. You know, there's a lot of caste issues in India. So when you enter a community, caste issue becomes a huge thing. So having a good understanding of social socioeconomic statuses, the political angle of how castes work within the communities, how other issues within the society and the communities work helped us a lot. So that gave us a, a huge advantage as soon as we started. Of course, there was some amount of outreach for acceptance of a particular activity. For example, you know, shifting from firewood to LPG cook stove took some amount of time, but we ensured that there was a tailor-made outreach activity which would reach to those communities. That helped us in a big manner. So what, what I, uh, uh, to sum up, uh, being a local and being able to speak the local language, being able to understand the local socio-political aspects helped us hugely with the communities. Thank you. We have about one minute left and I saw that my Fatiana, you raised your hand. So if you could give a, a brief response. Thank you. We can't hear you, please unmute. No, yes. Uh, Nitang Tsig is, yes. is working with uh, local people during uh, many years uh, on uh, development projects. So uh, when uh, we, we are working on uh, environmental project, local people is uh, collaborating easily because uh, they know that uh, it's all their benefits that we, we protect the environment, but not for us. So uh, the development project is, I think is uh, uh, the first thing that uh, we, we should do before protecting environment. Thank you very much. These are great responses. We'll continue the discussion after the next panel. Uh, so thank you all to the first uh, panel. Uh, we're going to move on to the second panel now. So if I could have that, that slide. Um, and so like with the first panel, we will, uh, they, we will have four speakers. Um, and so uh, uh, I've, been, I've introduced them previously. And so uh, the, and after this, uh, we will also have a question and answer. Um, as well. So please continue to put your, your questions in the chat. Uh, we have a whole team here that is working together in multiple languages to field your questions. So please don't hesitate to write them in Russian or French or English. Um, Il y a plusieurs langues pour répondre à vos questions. Donc, questions en français, anglais ou russe. Je vais demander euh, maintenant à, au prochain orateur de nous amener en Tanzanie. Over to you. Yeah, hope everybody is doing well today. 
Um, so my name is Benji Cassio. I'm the director you, of Con Can you turn on your video, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm the Con director of conservation and program development with Lion Landscapes, uh, previously known as Ruaha Carnivore Project. Um, I've been with the project for about four years uh, in varying capacity as a researcher, and I mainly deal with the um, human wildlife conflict and community engagement. Um, we've been active in the Ruaha area, which is in central Tanzania, since 2010. Uh, it was started by Dr. Amy Dickman from Oxford. Next slide. So we are in an area um, that is bordering uh, a large national park, Ruaha, and it is dominated by pastoralists who have cows, goats, and sheep. Um, and many of these pastoralists also have a tradition of killing livestock, um, sorry, hunting lions for cultural prestige and also in retaliation for attacks on livestock. Next slide. So when we were thinking about how to involve the community and how to protect the wildlife, um, we developed a very innovative uh, program called Community Camera Trapping. And the whole goal of Community Camera Trapping was to make sure that the communities um, realized that the, the wildlife itself had value. I think many times the presence of an NGO can be conflated with value from the wildlife, but we wanted to make a really direct connection. So what we did is we met with the villages and we talked about what kind of community benefits they would like. And they said, well, they'd like um, support for the pastoralists, mainly in the form of veterinary medicine. Um, they also wanted assistance with education and assistance with healthcare. So what we did is we set up um, this camera trap program whereby we gave each village, and currently we work with 12 villages, um, three camera traps to put on village land. This is not protected area. This is just pure village land. And we put um, points for, for each species of, um, each wildlife species. Yep, thank you. So we, we are a carnivore organization. So uh, the carnivores have the most points. Um, like a lion is 10,000, you see a hyena is 10,000. Um, and the wild dog, you see the group of wild dogs, each one is 15,000. Um, and the idea is, is to link these directly to the benefits. And so after every three months, we tally up all of the points from the wildlife presence in the cameras. And the group that has the most, uh, we put them in groups of four, and the group with the most amount of points gets around $1,200 to divide amongst those sectors. Um, all the way down to last place, still gets some money. Um, I believe they get around $400. And here we have some pictures of some of these benefits. Um, uh, one of the interesting things we started this year was to give out health insurance to individuals. I think there can be challenges when um, benefits are coming directly to the school or uh, to the health clinic. And so one of the improvements that we made is to try to target individuals more directly. Next slide. So this is all tied to us trying to provide education, make sure that um, the, the benefits aren't from lion landscapes, they're directly from the wildlife, and that um, one of the other benefits of this is that uh, there are a lot of problems with elephants and crop raiding. And although we don't work directly with that, um, you know, many of the stakeholders view us as protectors of all the wildlife. Um, and we emphasize that there's value from those elephants as well. Um, and an interesting note is that we have had these in villages that eventually did not have a significant amount of wildlife and we discontinued the work in those, those areas. Um, so it is something that I think we are trying to be very consistent with and to demonstrate that it is indeed the presence of wildlife that uh, will reward the villages. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. I'm sure that's going to stimulate some uh, some questions. Um, it's quite an interesting approach to, uh, that you're taking in your in your project. Um, so please don't forget you can put questions in the chat um, in in multiple languages. Um, so don't hesitate. Uh, we're now going to move on to our second speaker, which is uh, Dr. Bibuti Lankar, who is the head of, of uh, the Conservation and Livelihood Division and Elephant Research and Conservation in in an organization called Aranyak. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, please, uh, please over, over to you. You're going to take us to uh, India and Bhutan. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Dr. Bibhuti Lohakar. I am associated with NGO Color India. Uh, so I, am, I have been working in Manas landscape for last 20 years. Next slide, please. So uh, this, uh, our project is uh, securing uh, source population of tiger prey and habitat in Indo-Bhutan landscape. So it's a very, uh, as you know, Indo-Bhutan uh, landscape is, uh, is a second, second largest uh, ten, ten, uh, tiger conservation lands, uh, important landscape after the Mekong Valley. And this entire area, including Bhutan and India, cover around 5,000 square kilometer, which is home of uh, our over over 100 uh, globally treated uh, globally treated uh, animal and in some of the including some of the endemics like pygmy hawk uh, bang, uh, golden langur and some of the critical species critically endangered like white bellied heron bengal florican and things like that so uh, so this project are uh, in implemented with along with uh, forest department and then pantera Evely, and wildlife conservation trust so our project has mainly four components. Uh, basically, uh, be, 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 basically uh, research, uh, monitoring of tiger through camera trapping and have threat assessment, and then uh, protection. Uh, we we have been help, helping and supporting forest department through through smart patrolling, and then livelihood. Uh, particularly, we uh, uh, people living around uh, around the park. We are supporting supporting their livelihood and and. And also, uh, also the, also the awareness program, conservation awareness program. So basically, our and our um, uh, livelihood uh, activity is uh, is is basically we said push and pull model, protection forest department and our forest department identify people who are going inside the park, and basically we and and uh, we pull from the livelihood and education component. We pull them and try to help them uh, to reduce the dependency so that they. Uh, re reduce the uh, method uh, uh, different through different alternative livelihood activities. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, different phases of work, like initially we, we did through a focus group discussion, and then we did a baseline survey, and then community-based consultation on access restriction following the ESMS guideline. Then- Etabli. Une évaluation de leur volonté à participer selon les normes de l'UICN. Nous avons eu des, une, une espèce de foire qui a permis de démontrer. Nous avons également fait intervenir des inspecteurs. Maintaining, uh, site preparation, uh, support service, core monitoring, and 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 market uh, market linkage, and and also that monthly review. So we have basically, we have covered uh, 1400 household and uh, include uh, our model is family centric model. Anybody above 18, 18, we supported family, maybe yeah, one. Uh, maybe we say so we yeah. uh, two persons uh, who take category, one person mm. who take mushroom, that means, and we want a holistic development of the family. And and our model is women headed marginalized household, landless household, uh, agriculture, landless household, ways are not, and then solely dependent on the, on the park. Next slide, please. Abibutik, you have one minute left. And Benji, yes. can I ask you to please mute? Next slide, Go please. Ahead, yeah, next slide. So these are the, some of the uh, 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 glimpses of, uh, uh, glimpses of uh, farm-based activities and homestead garden work ex extremely well. Uh, next slide. And then these are the, some of the non non farm based activities. And out of that, weaving act, uh, weaving was very helpful, and that has extended substantially supported. Next slide. And the, we have also developed a product called Mana, to, so that for selling the uh, out out product of the of the project. Next slide. And uh, this is very interesting. Before pro, before starting projects, fifty eight percent where people were of uh, depend on the on the park on fuel wood. 
and towards the towards the 2001 you know, completely reduced and also you can see tiger population is also on for threefold that increases in the area so uh, thank you okay thank you very much Bibuti, for your for your presentation um, I'd like to remind uh, people to continue to put questions in the chat in the in the three languages. We're uh, translating those as well. Um, so our, uh, our next, we're going to move on to um, to Madagascar, and we're going to hear from Vairana Ranjamamoji, and uh, she will be talking to us about lemurs and and with, in a specific focus on on youth. So uh, Vairana, um, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, for the introductions, and uh, thanks for uh, hello everyone, and thanks thank you very much for attending this webinar. At the start, many apologies if you cannot see me now because uh, I have uh, an issue with my webcam. So uh, I think if you don't mind, uh, let me carry on with my speech. So my name is Moirana uh, Nadiamamuns, and uh, I am the regional coordinator within Madagascar Fukazi association based in Madagascar. Uh, we are uh, uh, 16 years of uh, existence and uh, our main uh, target is about uh, conservation, research and development. Madagascar Afokad's mission is uh, to promote and uh, conserve uh, endemic and threatened species through key targeted action in collaboration with all stakeholders. Uh, one of our uh, key action is to target youths to save the lemurs of Mangabe Reserve uh, and the fair habitats. This uh, initiative has started since uh, 2016, thanks to the funding uh, from the IUCN Save Our Species. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, for your information, the Mangabe Protected Area is located in the eastern part of Madagascar, and this is one of the protected er one of the seven protected areas we manage uh, with local communities in eastern part of um, Madagascar. Uh, in fact, uh, lemurs such as uh, the injury and the tiatin sivak uh, are critically endangered species, and uh, young people. Uh, seem to continue uh, forest clearing and lemurs hunting. Uh, so our aim is to reverse this uh, situation, to reverse this cycle, uh, meaning that uh, making young people as ambassadors of lemurs conservation while uh, improving their local livelihoods. Uh, our approach uh, is then to create youth groups in and around the Mangabe Reserve and to support them in the livelihoods of their choice. Uh, next slide, please. As a result, uh, 16 groups were created uh, with uh, 120 members in collaboration with technical services. Uh, these uh, youth groups receive necessary skills and support based on the speculation by fair choice, including sustainable farming techniques, awareness techniques, leadership and management, and self-esteem. Uh, five, uh, five main speculations were chosen by these uh, young people, uh, such as uh, waste culture, the beekeeping, uh, ginger, fish farming, and bean, beans culture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for instance, uh, thanks to these uh, uh, sustainable farming techniques support for training, uh, the youth group receive uh, one group who practice the low improved lowland waste culture, got a yield of three tons per hectare, and they now have an account of two million thousand uh, arriage. Uh, this is an equivalent of five hundred and twelve dollars. Uh, and uh, this group will always uh, continue uh, improved, uh, improved techniques and they are uh, ready to share their uh, uh, the skills 
pay Kent to uh, local villagers. In return, uh, young people take action to conserve lemurs, such as awareness campaigns on lemurs conservation and sustainable farming techniques. Recently, we celebrated with uh, young people the national day of lemurs in a local village where it's based with young people. Uh, these young people also have uh, demonstration plots uh, to, to show the improved um, uh, sustainable farming techniques and also to share uh, with villagers who are willing to adopt these new farming techniques. They also participate. Yeah, you, you, you have one minute left, please. Okay. Uh, they also participate in uh, conservation activities, including reforestation and patrols. And they also contribute to local development of their village by building bridges, uh, garbage bins, and so on. Uh, and so uh, in the future, we believe that in the power and the conviction of youths to conserve lemurs while driving local development in their villages. Thank you. Thank you, Boirana, for that interesting uh, um, look into involving youth in conservation. Uh, we'll come back to you with questions, Shirley. Please continue, everyone, to uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, and so now we're going to move on to our final uh, panelist in this uh, in the second part of, uh, of the webinar. We are going to move on to Kyrgyzstan. And so uh, we're going to hear from Kuban Zumbai Ulu um, about saving snow leopards and their prey species. And so, uh, Kuban, over to you. Can you please unmute? No, we still don't hear you. We'll ask him to unmute, it's going to be easier for him to come in. Kuban, we, we don't uh, we don't hear you. Ah, okay, he's going to put on his headphones. I see more questions coming in from the chat. Very good. Thank you very much. Kuban, we still don't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Oh. Please, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to meeting you all here today in this webinar. Uh, my name is Kuban Chpek, uh, and uh, I've been working as a country program director of the Snow Leopard Trust in Kyrgyzstan uh, since 2010. And I also lead the Snow Leopard Foundation in Kyrgyzstan, which implements uh, uh, several conservation. Пожалуйста, перейдите на следующий слайд. В Киргизии есть Киргизстан. Эта территория широко населена людьми, и здесь живые птицы и животные существуют под большим давлением, чем в других местах. К сожалению, у нас только два национальных парка в данной области, и они защищают только около 2% населения. Uh, in entire mountain range here. Uh, so the main goal of the project uh, supported by the uh, UCN SOS uh, program is uh, saving snow leopards and prey species in the Kyrgyzalato mountains by creating co-managed uh, nature protect areas. And these are similar to uh, community reserves uh, uh, by providing uh, livelihood opportunities to the local communities. Please, next slide. Uh, so based on the biological data we uh, collected in this area, these are a number of angulates, wild angulates, camera trapping data. Uh, we identified important areas for the uh, snow leopard conservation with this, uh, within this mountain range. Uh, we conducted a, a threat assessment workshop in the four communities. Uh, where we invited various uh, stakeholders, land users, like farmers, herders, uh, hunters, uh, 
pasture users, beekeepers, and, and also in you know, local uh, uh, government people. Uh, they ranked uh, sets uh, using three parameters uh, like area, intensity, and urgency of threats. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once uh, top uh, threats uh, were identified, we, we discussed uh, the interventions which can help to reduce the threats. So all these land users and then uh, uh, local government people attended these uh, meetings. Uh, and then community members brought many, many um, ideas for the interventions. Uh, and our selected interventions uh, benefit entire communities. And, uh, the, and they are located in the community land uh, uh, as a community property. Uh, please, next slide. So uh, local communities uh, made a final decision on selecting uh, these interventions. Uh, and then uh, uh, we signed uh, uh, conservation contracts with these local communities. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So these uh, projects are implemented in the, uh, in the area where uh, snow leopard populations uh, uh, have been uh, under big pressure last 30 years. And this uh, data collected uh, from this area is showing that the number is uh, going uh, down. Uh, number has been reducing. And this area serves as a bridge uh, connecting two bigger uh, snow leopard uh, populations. Next slide, please. Uh, so our interventions will help to uh, uh, local governments uh, and communities to improve their capacity on conservation. Unfortunately, the budget uh, of local governments is too low to implement conservation, uh, conservation activities. And that's the conservation uh, activities are not um, uh, seen as priority uh, in their plan. Uh, ben, you have uh, one minute left, please. Thank you. So we made black currant orchards, plantations in local, uh, two local um, uh, communities by planting uh, 1,250 black currant seedlings uh, per hectare. Uh, these uh, orchards were fenced and protected from livestock. So in future, these uh, orchards may provide uh, in average um, $25,000 uh, per season to community. So we signed conservation contract with the local people. According to the contract, you know, they will, they will um, use 50% of the future benefit to the conservation uh, goals. Uh, their main goal was um, um, solving the problem of pasture degradation. And once this sets are um, addressed, then they can, send, uh, they can spend money on other conservation goals. So livestock breeding has been the main income source in this area. So another, another intervention was building a, a veterinarian station. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kuban. Uh, so we've, ha we've heard um, from four panelists, and now we're going to go to uh, our second uh, question and answer uh, session. So, um, so we're going to start with um, uh, first with Benji. Um, there are a lot of questions uh, around this, the point system that uh, that you that you raised, um, and so. One of the questions comes is how sustainable is it? Uh, so, for example, when the when and if the project ever ends, uh, what what happens then with the point system and the and the valuing of of uh, wild animals for for these points and money? So, so what what is that sustainable strategy afterwards? Yeah, this is a great question that we uh, frequently get, and I always say that this is. You know, as we are looking for strategies to bring wildlife and value to local populations, um, this is a bit of a proof of concept. Um, you know, we are still learning things that go well, things that don't go well. I think our, um, you know, ideal world would be that the, the governments or the organizations that are willing to put forward those costs, um, you know, to bring value to that area, that they will step in. I mean, now, obviously, 
IUCN is, is assisting, but you know, if there's government buy-in and ways that uh, if we can show, hey, this is a way that both attitudes improve, conflict is reduces, and people get wildlife, um, they can, it can be a more effective uh, kind of way of, of giving these community benefits. Thanks for that answer. Uh, there, there's a, there, there are some follow up questions as well. There are a lot of questions about for, for you. Uh, one is one is about. I also had this question. Um, that, does it does it create uh, does the system point system create competition and jealousy? For example, if uh, some villages are located in, in habitats which naturally favor a distribution of some animals over others, um, have you had experience with that yet in your project? Um, there are always so there are issues with um, sometimes camera traps get lost or stolen, and it's always blamed on a neighboring village, um, whether that's true or not. I think we try to distribute the, we try to group the villages. So like I said, we have 12 villages that are in three groups of four, and we try to group them um, so that they do have similar habitat and they do have kind of similar wildlife. Um, and because we work along this border, which is along the river, uh, it kind of ensures that there's a there's similar habitats. Okay, and then maybe uh, may, maybe a, um, a a final a final one about the uh, um, about the about this question of of, of points and um, do does does it do villagers uh, try to entice uh, the wild animals to visit their village to uh, to have uh, to have more points in their in their camera traps. Um, we do not allow for artificial water holes or baiting. Um, we do encourage them, and I should mention that for each village, we have two camera trap officers that are in charge of placing the camera. Um, these are typically ex-poachers that know the areas of high wildlife density. Um, we've had people put them at livestock enclosures when they know that hyenas are coming every night, um, which is really what we want to see is that, yes, they can be a disturbance, but they can also bring value. Um, we are really uh, interested in collaboration and questions, so please, if um, your question wasn't answered or you want more information, um, I'll put my email in the chat, and, and please do not hesitate to contact us. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to Bibuti. Um, and so uh, we have a question about how do you manage potential conflict between traditional forest dependency and conservation objectives? Uh, yes, uh, basically, uh, uh, if you go through the history of Manas, Manas has a uh, civil turmoil of 22 decades, and during that entire infrastructure, entire system got collapsed, even Manas was declared as an Indian jar because it's a world heritage site. And then from 2005 onward, it started recovering. So, uh, so the people, uh, people dependency is still there. And and in this area has not uh, developed because this area has still because of the insurgency issues this area has access to development activities are still very uh, you know dependent on on the forest resources. However, in in particularly we that's what we have on, in one range particularly we have worked very effectively where a protection model. Uh, protection model is uh, recovering where you know people dependency is also where so that's why people, forest department people are push, pushing trying to push people who are earlier wholly depend on the on the on the on the throw even if they were going for hunting they were going for collecting firewood everything they were dependent on the on the park so now forest department is trying to get back the area and in the same time uh, so that we we were we are also working so that ripple dependency is also reduced through so this project particularly one range we have shown model but in other areas still you know people are collecting firewood people are people are collecting vegetable wild vegetable and things like that and there is a sharp uh, forest forest boundary and village start so there is no buffer on that okay thank you very much for that for that answer I'm going to move on to Vairana uh, and her question about how do you approach the youth as ambassadors for Lima conservation? Uh, as uh, our approach, uh, as uh, I told, is to create um, youth groups. So uh, bef uh, to make, to have these youth groups. So we run uh, uh, public consultations, we run 
series of uh, meetings in uh, in the local villages uh, within the Magape protected areas, and uh, we um, and we uh, did awareness to the local communities where young people uh, attend these meetings about the importance of uh, lemurs and also their habitats because uh, lemurs live uh, in the forest. So there is a connection between lemurs and forest. So we uh, convinced the local communities and these young people to form uh, a group uh, to become uh, as uh, ambassadors of uh, lemurs conservation. And uh, the creation of these uh, groups are uh, uh, during these uh, community meetings. And uh, when the group is uh, set up, so then after uh, we, uh, uh, we, gave, uh, we gave them the necessary uh, trainings and skills. So they uh, have to develop, to develop, to, to run uh, successfully their, um, their projects about conservation and also the livelihood activities. Oh, thank you very much. A follow-up question you. related to what you just said. Um, youth are looking for jobs and income. Uh, how do you address the complex question of youth employment in your project? Uh, yeah, uh, in the re because uh, these young people uh, live in a very, very remote places and uh, the, lack, the lack of jobs uh, is uh, an important problem. So uh, one step uh, we did now is uh, to, uh, to train these uh, young people to, uh, to become professional on the sustainable farming techniques. So our challenge is now because uh, we got uh, recently uh, a new funding for, from the Darwin uh, Initiative to continue these uh, youth projects for the next three years. So our uh, aim is to, uh, to train these uh, young people to be more professional, to create uh, cooperatives. Uh, uh, we would like to train them on the entrepreneurship uh, in order uh, for these uh, people, young people to, to access the markets. And so they can, uh, uh, they can uh, have uh, more uh, income to improve their livelihoods also. Uh, the objective of the Mangabe Reserve is to promote ecotourism. So these, uh, these young people uh, will, will also be employed when the ecotourism in Mangabe is uh, developed uh, during uh, uh, our, um, because the management plan is uh, recently updated and the ecotourism is one of the uh, alternatives of livelihood so these young people will be involved involved for the employment in the ecotourism while the access to the markets to uh, to sell to sell their product products and so we uh, our challenge is to support these uh, young people on that aspect Okay, thank you very much. I see, so, I see that my Fatian has also made some responses in the chat and I wanted to, to let you know that we'll be coming back in a few minutes to all the panelists. But, I, but before we do that, I wanted to also uh, ask a, specific, a question to Kuban. Um, so we had some questions about your intervention. What are the party, who are the parties to the co-management? Uh, who is involved um, in that? Uh, so, um, uh... In many places, uh, uh, government uh, sells hunting licenses to get money for nature protection. It it, it sounds very uh, bad, but but uh, when budget is, uh, can, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. We so can hear you. in the in the in the when when the country economy is not good and then when the budget is low, so they make uh, they sell a hunting license in order to. Uh, get money for nature protection. So when we when we sign co managed uh, when we sign MOU on co management, we say we come to the agreement with the government that, that they stop issuing hunting licenses, but we will provide to alternative um, ways, uh, alternative source of income, money for the uh, for the community rangers, 
uh, and then so they stop issuing hunting licenses and then they are part of this co-management. Uh, when we come to local government, we, we local communities and local government, we say, okay, we'll, we'll, we, we, this inter intervention, which I described, they are going in the combination with, or combination with other interventions like education programs, eco camps, small leopard enterprises where we produce handicrafts. So in, in, in the combination with many, many interventions, they are working really well. So local governments are signing MOUs with us saying that, okay, when, when we start getting benefit from this uh, black current uh, orchards, they will spend 50% of the benefit for the, for the um, improving pasture infrastructure, building bridges, taking livestock to, to other uh, pastures, starting pasture rotation program. So we have main three parties as, as, uh, uh, in the MOU. So these are local communities and government and Snow Leopard Foundation in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much. Um, a follow-up question is, are you seeing a reduction in threats based on the project intervention? Um, yeah, if I come to, uh, to, the, uh, to the interventions, which I described, unfortunately, we started, we started later, yeah? So we didn't, these orchards, they didn't give any fruits yet, any crops yet, but, but, but local communities, they believe that we will get it. So we, we took them to the other places and showed how people are getting benefit from similar uh, orchards. So they see that that definitely uh, this uh, this have high promises. So they are, they are working really well, and then and then through other uh, as I mentioned through other um, programs like education, uh, and then uh, community rangers and then patrols. Uh, so yeah, yes, we see uh, we see um, the uh, reduce of uh, poaching uh, by local uh, community members. Uh, we we started uh, setting up camera tabs uh, together with local people. So yeah, we, we see that um, uh, attitude to, of people to conservation has positively changed. Okay, and then a final question for you. Uh, how do you select the beneficiaries for the orchards? Uh, so beneficiaries are not going to, to, uh, to the Sonata Foundation. So as I said, 50% goes to the uh, conservation programs. 50% remains with the local government. They can spend this money to, to, to uh, pay to people to take care of this orchard, uh, to protect, or uh, maybe they will need money to improve the infrastructure of this place or, or plant another, another uh, orchard and make another orchard. Um, uh, and then we believe that this will go, uh, this will benefit local communities. And I, I see another question, which is talking about penalty system. Yeah, yes, well, um, penalty, um, penalty. Uh, no, it's it's not good way to start uh, with local communities with penalties. You know, um, first you should come to like um, uh, saying good things, not about penalties. So one, and then we have MOU where we 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 we, we described all the ways how we can improve. We are not talking about penalty lot, but. We have another uh, conservation programs like small but enterprises where our foundation provides additional bonus for the um, protection of nature. And if, if someone from local community does uh, illegal hunting in the area, then we do not provide additional, um, additional you know, bonus to the community. So this program is, um, this uh, orchard program is just starting and we are not talking about uh, penalty system yet. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so now we're going to ask all the panelists to, uh, to you, if you could please turn on your, your cameras as well. We're going to ask some questions uh, of, of all of you, so all eight of you. Um, so one that we've had that was uh, directed at, um, also at, uh, for, the, for two from Madagascar to uh, Maya Fatiana and Boyarana. Um, so lemurs are, are highly threatened throughout Madagascar. And so, how would you see your types of project interventions being scaled up to work in other areas where lemurs are also threatened? My Fatiana, do you want to go first? Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, uh, for, in my opinion, uh, sensitizing local people is a uh, uh, a very good thing to do to uh, pro 
to conserve and protect lemurs and uh, its habitat in, uh, in Madagascar. But uh, this is not possible if uh, the, uh, the livelihood is not good. So uh, we should before uh, do something about the, uh, their life, uh, giving, uh, giving them uh, building capacity about uh, agricultural or uh, to, to have a better life. And like this, they can uh, protect lemurs as well. Okay, thank you. Vajrana, do you, do you also want to answer? Yeah, uh, I would like to answer. As uh, I mentioned, uh, our uh, initiative about youth uh, has uh, started since 2016, so during the, the, two, the, the two first years of the initiative. So we, uh, we focused on the young people living uh, only within the Mangape Reserve. And uh, after this uh, first round of the projects, local communities uh, reported that the, the migrants, because uh, one of our big problems is that the, the migrants from the other sites of the protected areas, so they are the, the main uh, people who do the illegal activities, like the deforestation and, uh, and so on. And so we, um, we expanded the, the projects to uh, to another uh, municipality uh, outside outside Mangabe protected areas, and uh, and now for the next three years, we uh, also expand to uh, to another municipality. This uh, uh, youth initiative. So I think it uh, it could be uh, it can be replicated at uh, at the regional scale because all these municipalities are uh, in the Alotamanguru region in the eastern part of Madagascar. And so by, uh, by showing the, the results from municipality to municipality, I think that uh, it can be scaled up and uh, why not to the, at the national level. And uh, for sure, uh, working, working closely with all the stakeholders and uh, one of the priority of the government, uh, because uh, uh, the, the main leaders are actually uh, went to the COP26 at Glasgow. So uh, uh, the initiatives to uh, conserve uh, biodiversity and to fight climate change uh, is uh, included in the priorities of uh, governments. So I, uh, I, uh, I have a hope uh, Government and uh, other stakeholders will support us to uh, to scale up this uh, initiative. Okay, thank you very much. I, I have a I have a, a general question to the panelists. Um, project selection and funding inevitably requires something resembling what we call a, a business case that quantifies benefits, something like a cost benefit analysis. Um, do you speak? Do 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 any of the panelists quantify benefits in financial terms? And if so, how do they do that? If you are interested in answering that question as a panelist, can you please raise your hand? It's quite a challenging one with a, a business case, often trying to associate uh, what we do with costs. Uh, yes. Sorry, Inza, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a problem with my headset, so I'm trying like this. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Yeah, we, we did a cost benefit uh, study uh, focused on uh, the concept of ecosystem services. Um, yeah, so uh, in this study, we use uh, this traditional method that are used by economists uh, to assess the benefits provided by the different services in terms of, uh, I would say, economic uh, uh, benefits. And we also uh, studied opportunity costs. So when communities decide to go for conservation, uh, what are the opportunity costs incurred to them? So we estimated all this 
and we put also into the balance uh, uh, the put a future perspective like uh, if you were able to sell a uh, credit carbon in the future what would conservation bring to communities as compared to uh, I would say cutting the forest and create a plantation of oil palm, for instance. And it was very clear that conservation would bring more benefits than other forms of exploitation of the forest. And this has been a good, a strong argument for communities to understand that conservation is thus not a luxury, but is indeed, I would say, uh, I would say an economic, uh, uh, perspective is to consider when you uh, en engage in into conservation activities. Thank you. Anybody else from the panel would you like to talk about this uh, this issue? Ah, Bibuti, yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, we have. We are also doing the cost benefit analysis, and on the product which we sell, uh, it it's uh, bas basically twenty eighty percent goes to community. 10% for overall development of the villages and and 10% for for development of some of the infrastructure for example solar street light or things like if they want uh, some water facilities in the villages that 10% uh, goes to for that so we that that is our our system it out of 100% so that's how we are managing and, and out of 80%, that also rotate for, for next year, say, for example, uh, pro procurement of seed or, uh, or buying a trade for weaving, weaving oh yeah, like that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a related question for all of you is uh, community expectations. So um, in my experience and all of your experiences, I imagine when when a conservation organization starts working in a community, there could be very high expectations about what a project will deliver and what it can deliver and um, and versus what it can't. And so how do you manage high community expectations in your projects? Is there someone from the panel that would like to answer that? Yes, Sanjay. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, what's very important is to explain the objectives of that uh, of our work itself right at the beginning. Um, otherwise, uh, it can build uh, expectations and it can also break expectations. So it's better to explain our objectives and we should be firm footed to say no to certain things. That's very important with them when you're working with the community. You need to have the, uh, uh, we need to have the leverage and we need to have the uh, uh, outreach uh, communication methodology to explain uh, what is permissible and what is not permissible within the uh, within the, uh, the scope of our work. So it's very important right at the outside to explain our objectives that uh, we are not uh, uh, we are not in there to do all kinds of developmental activities. We are not in there to solve all problems in uh, uh, in the area or in the communities, but. Uh, some of the issues which we can uh, try and help them is also linked to wildlife conservation. That should be a primary objective, um, which needs to be explained very uh, clearly is what I feel in my opinion. Thanks. Benji, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I think this is a really great point. Um, and especially as many conservation organizations that have maybe dealt uh, more, you know, maybe the origins were specifically with ecological issues, um, and I think we can think that we go for one community meeting and we agree and it's fine. And I think it's, there's a real importance um, to really invest in community engagement and to really invest in these meetings. And I know that we spend far more time than we might expect um, meeting with whether it's the village government um, or just you know, average stakeholders um, to yeah, explain exactly here's what we can and can't do. And I think for us, it's, it's really critical that we're always explaining that our presence and our funding is tied to wildlife. Um, and there are things that we, we really try to find partners. Um, so at least if they say, oh, we really want you know, this bridge to be fixed, um, we know who to refer them to. This could be the local government, this could be external funders. Um, but I think it's a really important side that uh, can, can catch us unexpected sometimes because I think we're so, we can be so focused on wildlife. 
Uh, so maybe you can continue to answer this question, but there's a related one that I think helps us also to think about this is that are any of you partnering with development organizations in your work? Uh, Benji just alluded to directing people towards development organizations, but are any of you partnering with them when it comes to community expectations that go beyond what our projects can deliver? I thought I saw, Babuti, is that a raised hand to speak yes. for? Yes, okay, uh, Babuti, yes, and then I think so... I saw Sanjay as well. First Babuti. Yeah. So uh, the, this was a big challenge when we started the project because our area is, as I already uh, mentioned, is access to development is very less. When we start selecting the beneficiaries, uh, there was a huge pressure on us to, to uh, and people were asking that uh, why we, are, we will also not get benefit like that. So then we have filtered and as Sanjay said, we clearly mentioned these are the people we will target and and we uh, and that's how we have we have selected uh, but same time we have also done con convergence with the government uh, government active uh, government scheme uh, people whom we we are not able to uh, take uh, support could su could not support through our project we have we have uh, worked through agriculture department or veterinary department so that they, they can receive support through them so that's how we we did Thank you. Uh, I see many hands raised, but I think Sanjay was next, please. What's very important uh, is as a conservation organization and as conservationists, we need to be very clear that we cannot solve all social problems when we get into an area. Uh, that's the primary understanding we need to have as conservation organizations. Perhaps we can collaborate, we can downtail, um, you can act as a levering agent, leveraging agent, uh, but we should not uh, put our hand into all uh, problems, uh, including all the social problems. Every problem is important, but it's very important for us to understand what is our capability, where does our expectations and expertise lies, um, and uh, work within those frameworks. You know, a lot of times, otherwise conservation organizations get very uh, uh, deviated from their prime objectives, and uh, that's where things start going wrong. So it's very important to have a focus, uh, to have a clear understanding what are the problems we can address as a conservation issue, uh, as a conservation organization with the amount of uh, resources and especially expertise available with us. Thank you. Manali, sorry, I think your hand has been raised for a long time. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just to compliment other um, participants, other speakers, um, in Lao PDR, because poverty reduction also a priority um, in parallel with uh, green growth dimension, conservation dimension. So um, WCS as a conservation organizations are working very closely with, um, with other stakeholders who work in poverty reduction programs, including the, the government implemented projects that are funded by the big donors, such as the EU, the World Bank, ADB and other uh, uh, donors. And then, but um, the, the thing that we are doing right now is to make sure that any activities, any projects that are happening within the proximity or, or within the landscape scale of the protected area that we are working in has to be uh, conservation compatible. I think that's one thing that we always coordinate, uh, help the government coordinate with other stakeholders and uh, not to mention, uh, uh, not to mention uh, infrastructure projects, uh, other investment projects and poverty reductions all have to be done in a consolidated way, in a harmonized way so that the conservation objectives are not compromised. And um, I think that the landscapes approach that uh, integrated landscape management and planning approach are the answer to that uh, collaborative management and, and planning as well. Thank you, Manoli. My Fatiana. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, in, in our part, uh, uh, Nitantika have uh, our donors working closely with com local community too on the school feeding around the protected area, not inside the protected area. So all the primary school all, all around the protected area receive uh, uh, 
uh, food every day. So uh, like this, people inside the forest can go out and uh, not do deforestation inside the, for, uh, in, inside the protected area. It's one of our uh, partners. Uh, there's our partners who is uh, building uh, a school outside the protected area too, or giving uh, or building uh, hospitals outside the protected area. So we incite people going out the forest like this. There's no deforestation, no more deforestation uh, in the uh, in the protected area in our project. Thank you, uh, Inza. Yeah, uh, to come back to how to deal with the expectations of the of communities, you have to be clear, like uh, most speakers said, right from the beginning about your objectives and uh, what you can do, what you cannot do, what you should do, what you should not do. And uh, once this is clear, uh, you have communities also understand the implication of conservation for their own economic activities. So everything is connected. They have to understand this very clearly and they really can understand it easily. If you explain, you don't even need to teach them. You learn from each other. They have their own perspective on how analyzing, I would say, relationships between uh, conservation and their economic activities, for instance. They all know that, for instance, um, it's thanks to forests that you have rainfall. It's thanks to rainfall that you can practice agriculture or fisheries, things like this, so they know clearly. And after that, you make a stakeholder analysis to do what, who can do what. Uh, in what, uh, I would say, the activities of different stakeholders are related to the ones of other stakeholders and so on. And then we have many types of uh, expectations. You have the general expectations for development and you have personal expectations. You have to take all these into account and try to answer what you can answer. Uh, it's not uh, about uh, showing that we have to make a choice between conservation and development. All these have to be combined. And uh, it's natural that all these are combined. And we work indeed with development agencies, like uh, in the Francophone system, we have what we call the regional councils. So these are uh, governmental regional authorities that are in charge with development. But also in their, I would say, uh, duties is uh, conservation. They are also supposed to be working for conservation. So we bring them this opportunity to combine their development plans with conservation plans. And uh, yeah, they have to be by our side to talk to communities. A community needs roads, for instance, to need school. This is the primary business of this regional uh, council. So they have to tell this clearly to communities. And uh, when responsibilities are clear, you can face their expectations in a coherent manner. Thank you very much. Um, so I see that Sanjay as, a, as another, as his, uh, he's in the field. We really appreciate you joining from the field and that his laptop battery is, is dying. Um, we're going to move on to some highlights, but it, it, there is a, a minute, uh, a, a few, if you wanted to say a, a last, uh, have a last response, uh, Sanjay, before we move on to the highlights, um, that, that would be fine. Or maybe you have no, not enough battery. <laughs> um, all right, maybe we'll move on, move on to, uh, uh, we'll move on to the highlights. So I wanted to, to thank you all very much for, for, the, for this um, very rich, uh, these rich presentations, these discussions, and these questions. Um, just for the next few minutes, we, we've, um, we're going to present some of the highlights that we've been uh, hearing. Uh, some of them come from, from my own observations and listening to you. Some of them come from the team here uh, in England um, as they've been listening to you as well. Um, so some of the highlights that uh, that struck me, one of the first is, is the flexibility in, in, uh, in adapting project interventions. Um, this is uh, extremely important as, uh, as uh, Sanjay was noting that there's, you, you, with their LPG gas interventions, you need to be able to adapt to government schemes, to private sector schemes, uh, to remote situations, and that there is, no, there is no one size fits all. And so it's a really great example of how you can take one 
one general type of intervention and try to adapt it to many different types of local challenges. So I think uh, flexibility is, uh, is, is quite important. And this is in line with sustaining, sustaining alternative resource use, such as through, through gas. Um, and to try to, um, uh, to try to work with, with, uh, with, with companies in this innovative way to replace a natural resource um, uh, in the project area. Um, another, another one that really struck me is the understanding of community perspectives with forests. We heard some brilliant examples of how some organizations are, are valuing local cultural heritage. And, and from Kone, I, I heard the, the, that this was one of the first things that was done when they started working with the community more than 10 years ago. And that when the community saw that their local knowledge and their cultural values were being recognized, they really did want to collaborate. Um, in India, we see, uh, we see that uh, they, they have, uh, um, Sanjay was telling us there are local staff uh, speaking local languages, and these staff also have, some of them have had, uh, he spoke of himself having rural childhoods. And so this, this, rather than having an urban perspective, which we can be criticized, and we've, I've seen this criticism quite recently in the conservation literature and debates, that we also need a rural perspective because we're dealing with uh, rural situations. And so understanding a community rural perspective and having it uh, through your staff is quite important as well. Um, we also heard a lot about zoning and use. Uh, and so building in multi-use zones uh, that still safeguard critically endangered species, we've heard a lot about that, but also encouraging traditional and sustainable resource use. Um, this also is quite quite important and in having places where, where um, species can live and then where people can also uh, can also can also cultivate. Um, also, the, the long term engagement with communities is, an, is something that nearly all of you, I think all of you actually said. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, some people said it was immediate um, if they understood their, uh, the communities they're working with. And others, it took a, um, a, bit, a bit longer. It probably depends a lot on the history of conservation in the area um, and, and how governments and NGOs have been engaging in the past. At least that's my experience. But in what we, what we did here is that even after 10 years in Ivory Coast, there, there will be a community area that will be recognized by the government after 10 years of engagement. And so the, this engagement is, uh, also has, uh, is, is quite important for local people, but also for conservation um, itself. Um, along with engaging with communities, we also see that, um, that different sectors can become important. We heard Mais on voit aussi que différents secteurs peuvent participer. Oh, and as part of outreach. So this was definitely a, definitely a highlight. Um, another one was the issue of finance. At what point our, our activities are financed by uh, a donor versus by the government and what the long-term and sustainable uh, perspective. It's a challenge, it's a remaining challenge that, that we have and that we have to think uh, creatively on how to, um, how to have a long-term and sustainable conservation engagement uh, where, where we are. Um, and fi and uh, an another highlight is probably equating things to money and expectations, partnering with development organizations and scaling up. So what can we deliver versus not? What are we skilled at doing? What do communities expect versus what we can deliver? Um, many of you spoke about how you must be very clear from the beginning what is possible, what you can do and what you cannot do. Um, and so don't be afraid to say, no, we can't do that, but also uh, there are some of you mentioned how you can also help put them in contact with uh, organizations that can help work on some of those uh, some of those issues. So uh, we we can't address all societal problems, but we can try to work with communities to to put them in contact or to work on on some of these other issues in partnership with development organizations, which is what some of you also uh, were doing. So these are these are some of the highlights that I had and. Um, it has been uh, fantastic listening to you. Thank you very much for a rich uh, uh, conversation. I think at this point, I'll now pass back to, to Anna for the closing remarks. Thank you, Gretchen. So first of all, I would really like to express my appreciation to the speakers for their valuable contribution to our webinar. 
My deepest gratitude goes to you, Gretchen, uh, for your expert facilitation and all who attended the webinar and helped to make it such a successful event. Last but not least, I'd like to convey a special thanks to the interpreters who have importantly helped make the seminar more accessible. Our future depends on the sustainable coexistence of livelihoods and conservation. Encouragingly, today we've heard inspiring examples, including those from across Africa and Asia, where the demands of conservation and livelihoods have been reconciled. We've also learned that there is no one answer to the question, what makes livelihoods work? But today, together, we've helped bring answers to these questions and hopefully inspire some action by sharing and raising awareness of the best practice examples that do make livelihoods work. Let's keep sharing. Thanks one more for joining, and I will now close this event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care, all of you.